Let's pray before I begin. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the happiness of this day. We thank you for the relaxation of this day. But we thank you above everything, Father, that we as Christians know how to relax in God, but how also to be fervent in God. Father, I thank you for this lovely meeting, Lord, the happiness and the spirit of joy that's been upon it. And thank you we've got something wonderful to celebrate, because we know the truth, we know our Saviour, and we know where we're going. Oh, Father, this world is so full of people who just don't know where they're going, who are making heroes out of drunkards and womanizers. And yet, Father, we just thank you that we have a Saviour, the only foundation We've got a Saviour who loves us, who's going to see us through anything that comes our way. Father, I pray that as I share these things tonight, it will underline and underpin our faith, the faith that we've got, that we might see that the Word of God can be trusted. It really is the same Word that Jesus had, and it's the Word that Moses received from you. Father, I pray that as I give this factual Bible study tonight, that the anointing of God may be upon my words, and that we should know that the unction of the Holy Spirit is upon them, that indeed we should feel that yea and amen in our heart of hearts. Oh, Father, I just pray for any who are hearing this tape, that you will move upon them by your Spirit. And if they don't know you, that, Father, the Holy Spirit will introduce them to Jesus. Father, for those who are Christians who may have doubts about the Word of God, will you cause their doubts to be dissolved away even in this next hour or so? And Father, for us all, may we be thrilled and excited because we have this wonderful book that you have given us. Thank you, it's part of our birthright. Thank you, it's a legacy that you've given to us. And Father, may we use it and may we study it diligently. In Jesus' name I would ask it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I'm so grateful for the comeback after this morning's talk, and I'm glad that many of you enjoyed the scientific uh, facts that I actually put forward this morning. Could I say to you that no matter how much proof, in inverted commas, you give to the unbeliever, if he's determined not to believe, he's not going to believe. But at least we should fulfill that word, which is given in um, Peter, where it says that we must be ready to give a defense of our faith to any man who actually asks us about it. Now, I hope this morning you've been equipped for that task. Now, this evening, I want to speak about what I outlined as the third question that we had to answer. Do you remember in the first Bible study that I gave in this series, I actually... Uh, talked about five questions that we've got to answer. We dealt with two this morning. We saw uh, the question, was there any objective evidence that the Bible really is the Word of God and not just the Word of man? And I hope you're convinced that there is plenty of evidence to show that God had to be the one who wrote it. And the second thing we asked this morning was, if God is the author of the book, how did he communicate his Word to these human authors who actually penned it. And I hope now you understand a little bit about the doctrine of inspiration, that God breathed the Scripture. They were men moved by the Holy Ghost. And their character comes through and their idiosyncrasies come through, but nevertheless it's the very Word of God. Now I hope you all understand that. Now we're going to spend the whole of this evening dealing with the third question. Because this third question is a very important one, and may I say, I have a lot of sympathy with people who ask this question. What they say is this, well, the Bible that we've got in our hands is based on very old manuscripts. And these old manuscripts have been copied from other manuscripts, and those manuscripts have been copied from other manuscripts, and those manuscripts have been copied from other manuscripts, which then might have been copied from the original. And what they say is, it's so hard to copy things out, isn't it likely that all sorts of bad errors have got into this Bible? In other words, how can you claim that this is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, when it's quite obvious that if men have copied it out, there are going to be errors in that particular copying? 
I have a lot of sympathy for this particular point of view, but you'll notice this, that whenever you read the words of Jesus, he seems to imply that he will look after his word, right? He is watching over his word to perform it. And the minute you understand that there is a real God who is capable of communicating with people and quite capable of looking after his word, then you can see that it is within the realms of possibility that in fact the word of God that we have might be the original word as delivered to Moses, as delivered to Daniel, as delivered to David, as delivered to Jesus himself, as delivered to Paul and the other apostles. There is a possibility. You'll also notice that Jesus more or less says that the word will be preserved. Can we have a look at the only scripture we're going to tonight, right? This is most unusual for me, as you know. In Matthew and chapter 5. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks about the law, and sometimes the law is used just for the first five books of the Bible. At other times, it's used for the whole Old Testament. And look what it says in verse 17 of Matthew 5. Verse 17 and verse 18. It says this, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, says Jesus, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then he says this, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, not one jot or tittle is going to be lost from this word. First, the heavens and the earth are going to be lost. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? Do you know what a jot and a tittle is? We read this many times without actually stopping to think. For those of you, and there may be a few here, who don't know what a jot or a tittle is, let me um, just spell it out for you. All right, now I'm using the overhead projector here. A jot is actually the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew letter yod. There it is. In the Hebrew alphabet, you have, I think it's 22 letters, and in fact, the smallest of them is this letter yod. It's like a little comma. And what Jesus is saying is not even the smallest letter is going to be dropped from my word. And by the way, one letter makes an awful lot of difference, doesn't it? Right? I mean, got and goat are worlds apart, and yet there's only one letter difference between them. Not one letter. A tough and touch have one letter difference. There's worlds of difference between those two. But Jesus said, listen, he says, the heaven and the earth are going to pass away, but I'll tell you this, not one jot is going to be lost from my word. A tittle is even smaller than a yod, right? That's what a tittle is, right? T-I-T-T-L-E. And a tittle is a little mark that changes a letter. For example, if you take the letter F in the English alphabet, if you add a tittle to it, it becomes an E. You see, that's what a tittle is, how small it is. Or if you take an L, a small L, and you add a tittle, it becomes a T. If you take the word fun with an F, F-U-N, and you add a tittle, it becomes pun. Do you see, it's a little mark that just joins up the top of the F. So a tittle can make an awful lot of difference. In Hebrew, it makes a tremendous amount of difference. Here's the letter kaf, kaf. If you add a tittle to it, can you see that extra little bit that's been added at the bottom? You get the letter beth. And there's worlds of difference between those two. Now that's what we mean by a jot and a tittle. So Jesus is actually saying, listen, he says, I'll tell you this, my word will be preserved and even a jot and a tittle is going to be preserved in my word. And it's rather interesting if we have a look at the history of the text of the Bible to see how God has indeed preserved his word. I can't say that every jot and tittle has yet been totally filled in in the original manuscripts. But we're certainly heading towards that way, as we'll see today. Let's understand the objection that the unbeliever puts before us, or even the modernist Christian. 
I mean, it is hard, isn't it, copying out letters? It is hard copying out sentences. Do you know, before I was a Christian, I used to be mad on Tibet. I mean, absolutely mad on the subject of Tibet. And I once copied out some Tibetan treaties, translations of them. They were done in Tibetan and in English. You know, Colonel Francis' young husband, those of you who know your Tibetan history will know all about this. And Colonel Francis' young husband actually wrote certain manuscripts. They were translated into Tibetan and into English. I decided to copy them out. Do you know, it took three goes before I got it perfect. You ask the proofreaders of my books, and there are some in the midst here, Trying to get those mistakes out is very difficult. You can read something and it looks all right. And someone says, oh, but that's spelt wrong. So it is. And you hadn't seen it before. Well, let me show you the, the problem that they had. Um, and this is a, a great problem. Let me just show you. The uh, original manuscripts in Greek were written without any breaks between words. I mean, the letters just followed straight on. There were no full stops, no question marks. Uh, no inverted commas or anything like that. You literally got all the letters joined together. So that's how it looked, if you can imagine a page. And you didn't just have a little bit like this. You had page after page after page of stuff like this. Now, that's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, you're copying it down, and sometimes you surely would miss out a particular letter. I mean, even in English we would. Look at this. If we write... Uh, a very famous verse, the same way, for God so loved the, the world that, that he... You have to look very carefully. I mean, you can all read the first line easily. You jump down to the fourth line. Some that who so eve. It's just joined up, you see. Now, to try and copy something like that is very, very difficult indeed. And this is why errors sometimes do creep in. And the unbeliever is simply saying, he's not being hypercritical or anything, he's simply saying, look, this is a real problem and you've got to face up to it. I've even suggested here that you um, try and copy out the book of Romans sometime. Why don't you do that? If you don't believe that copying is difficult, you write a hand copy of the book of Romans. By the way, you know that every time a king was crowned in Israel, he had to write out the whole law by hand. Did you know that? And you think my Bible studies are long? Do you know on certain feast days all the people had to stand and the whole of the law was read to them? Now, you'd be very thankful to have a Bible teacher who only speaks for an hour and a half after you've been through that, you see. And you just try copying out the book of Romans sometime if you think it's easy. Uh, can I show you a little experiment? Now, we've done it in large print on there, but I think the triangle's too big on this large print. Can I just show you, this is my original copy that I handed on to Keith to do it. Can you see that little triangle there? How many of you have seen that little triangle before? Could you put your hands up? Right, now I don't want you to answer. How many haven't seen that little triangle before? Could you put your hands up? Good. Now it's you people I want to address. Can you see the writing in it? Just read the writing, can you? Right, not out loud. No, don't. Not out loud. Just uh, read it to yourself. Now, it definitely says there, Paris in the spring. Hands up there if you know that that says Paris in the spring. Would you just raise your hands? Yes. Now, that's an awful lot of people, isn't it? If I tell you... No, don't talk about... Uh, uh, if I tell you that it doesn't say Paris in the spring, would those people who've just raised their hand have another look at it? Paris in the spring. Hands up if you still think it says Paris in the spring. Be honest about this. Now, come on, there are more than that. Be honest. <laughs> Paris in the spring. It definitely says Paris in the spring, doesn't it? It does. Doesn't it? Hands up if you can still see Paris in the spring. Hands up and be honest. Now, those of you who can read that properly, do you know that sometimes you can go on for a whole hour and the people still can't see it? It's true. Now, this is, will come as a revelation for some of you. It actually says, Paris in the, the spring. <laughs> How many of you couldn't see that? Would you put your hands up here? Now, isn't that remarkable? You see, that shows us, I think, I chose that example because I think it's a helpful one. Sometimes when you're looking at things, you can't actually see for looking. 
And those of you who've done any proofreading at all, you know that's true. You tend to read into the sentence what you think it says rather than what it does say. Actually, do you know the art of being a Bible teacher is to actually see what it says, not what you think it says. And it's that little switch that is enough to make you a Bible teacher, funnily enough, you see. But these people spent their lives copying out texts, you see. An old text of the Bible would begin crumbling at the edges, so they'd have to make a new copy. Now, sometimes it took one or two years to make a copy. Now, you imagine sitting at this desk with your flickering candle and your quill pen, and you're copying out one letter after another. Do you see that they would tend to say, the unbeliever would say, of course mistakes will be made. I'll let you into a little secret. In my book that's out next month, the lady who typed it, who was the nice lady I mentioned this morning, she was very accurate indeed, but you know, she actually at one point missed out a complete line. She had to type it all again. Now She had to type it three times. Can you imagine the patience of this lady? In her first draft, a whole line had been missed out. Now what had happened? She was working along, She'd seen the word the, the next word didn't begin with the, but the line after did, and she'd gone straight onto the the there and carried on. I don't blame her either for doing that. You try it if you think it's easy. Those of you who are typists, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes? It's hard, isn't it? You see? Now, obviously, year after year spent copying things out. And so they say inaccuracies come in. I want to remind you of this, however, that the Bible isn't the only ancient book that we deal with. Do you know, most of our knowledge of ancient history has come from ancient manuscripts. Did you know that? But the funny thing is, we take ancient manuscripts that deal with ordinary history as fact. The unbeliever never quibbles about them. Do you know, you think you know about the life of Julius Caesar? Yes, that he was murdered and he invaded Britain and so on and so on and so on. Do you know, we've got all of the information we know about Julius Caesar from ancient manuscripts. And yet we never bother to say, oh, well, they're inaccurate. Oh, no, it's, all, it's always the Bible that gets it in the neck for inaccuracy. Your history master never stands up and says, now, listen, I'm going to deal with the history of the Greeks, but I should warn you that the texts we got this from are rather inaccurate. Never warns you about that. He plows on as if this is fact. But come to the Bible. Now listen, you can't take the Bible literally. Right? It's based on old manuscripts. You can't trust old manuscripts. Have you noticed this amazing difference that there is? To fill in the background, I've listed up a few of the ancient manuscripts from which we learn our history. And you might be interested in this. If you take the sheet that you've got, the duplicated sheet, you'll see some of the manuscripts that we've got that teaches our old history. And this is remarkable. Now, you may not know this, but this will be an eye-opener to you. And what I'm going to do, and I just warn you about this, I'm going to test these by the Bible in just a minute to see whether the Bible has more manuscripts, is better attested than this. Which is the most trustworthy, in other words? For example, there at the top, we have Caesar's Gallic Wars. A very famous piece of ancient history. A lot of Roman history based upon it. It was written 100 BC to 44 BC. That's over 2,000 years ago. The first copy we have of it dates from 900 AD. We have no other copies before 900 AD. The gap, therefore, between the time that it was written and the first copy we've got is 1,000 years. And we have only 10 copies of it. Well, okay, let's uh, go on. The next one is Livy's Roman history. And those of you who've had a classical education, you all have heard of Livy, right? Otherwise, the others will call it Levi, but it's not. It's Livy's Roman history. And this was written 59 BC to 17 AD. Now, I've been kind here. We have one little fragment of it, a very small amount indeed, that comes 400 AD. So the time span then, I've been very kind. Because of that, that's not bad. 20 copies. Not bad. Plato. Now, by the way, you can go into Smith's in Bognor Regis. Not now, because they're closed. And you could have said, oh, have you got a copy of Plato? And they would have said, certainly. And they'd have got you a copy of some of Plato's writings. No one would have said, look, you've got to watch this. Right? They may be inaccurate. No one said it. Look at Plato. 
427 BC to 347, it's around that time, BC. The first copy we have dates from 900 AD. We don't even know it's the original Plato, you see? But that's the copy that called itself Plato. And that's a gap of 1,200 years, and we've got only seven copies of it. Seven copies, that's all. And yet we take that for granted, that that really is Plato. Served up on a Plato. <laughs> Next one. Tacitus, right? For a man whose name means silent, he wrote an awful lot of books. Tacitus, his famous books called the Annals of Tacitus, right? They date from 100 AD, so they're fairly new uh, compared to Plato. Uh, the earliest copy is 1100 AD. That's a gap of 1,000 years, and we have 20 copies of it. That's not bad. Herodotus, that's a very famous book indeed. That gives us the history of the Persians and, uh, you know, the ancients. He deals with Assyria and one or two other things. And I take a lot of little facts from it. At times, I hope they're right. Herodotus's history is 480 to 425 BC, but the first copy we've got is 900 AD. That's a gap of 1300 years, and we've only got eight copies of it. Aristotle. Now, everyone knows about Aristotle and his writings. Everyone. Don't see me after if you didn't. Aristotle, 384 BC to 322 BC. The earliest copy we've got dates from 1100 AD. That's a gap of 1400 years. There's silence in that 1400 years, and we've only got five copies of it. It's quite staggering, this. Pliny the Younger, he's the chap who reported about the uh, eruption of Mount Vesuvius and so on. And we learn quite a lot about the biblical characters, you know, like Herod's descendants from him and so on. A good chap. Uh, 61 AD to 113 AD. The first copy we have is 850 AD. That's a gap of 750 years and there are seven copies. And last of all, dear old Suetonius, sounds like a pudding, um, Suetonius is 75 AD to 160 AD. The first copy we have is 950 AD. That's a time gap of 800 years, and we've got eight copies. Now, the history we learn from these is taken as fact. You'll notice the average time gap is about 1,000 years, and the average number of copies is about 10. Now, if the Bible had a time gap of about 1,000 years you know, between the earliest manuscript we've got and the time that it was written. And we had an average of about 10 copies of it. The Bible would be as accurate as these. And so we have to now look at the Bible and we have to say, well, how does the Bible compare to that? And if you want to make notes on the back of your sheet, feel free. Or perhaps you'd like to compare the Bible information I'm going to put up now with the sheet you've got in front of you. Let's have a look at the Bible. All right? Now, I'm going to cover this up, and uh, I'm going to reveal it slowly. I've uh, given the same headings. The author is God. You'll forgive me for my uh, fundamentalism coming through there. All right. Let's take the New Testament first. This is just the New Testament. When was the New Testament written? Well, it was written between 40 and 96 A.D., that compares quite favorably, doesn't it, with the other writings. Um, we have a fragment from 130 AD. All right, just a fragment. It's about half a page that dates from 130 AD. But we have complete uh, copies from about 325 AD. Oh, by the way, I should tell you, in 1850, there was a man called Professor Bauer, spelt differently, Mike, from your surname, but Professor Bauer spent his whole life trying to prove that John's Gospel wasn't written until 160 AD. The fragment we have from 130 AD, which was found fairly recently, is of John's Gospel. <laughs> well, a man has wasted his whole life. Right, what's the time span? Well, the time span is 34 to 229 years. If you have a look at your list, you'll see none of the ancient histories compared to it at all. This is far shorter in time, 34 years to 229. And how many copies do we have? Do you remember we had on average about 10 copies of each of the others? Well, we have 13,000 copies of the New Testament. This is quite remarkable. 
On this comparison, if anything is to be doubted, it's our ancient history, not the Bible. Do you see that? 13,000 copies of the New Testament before us. And by the way, that's not all we've got. In fact, I've listed up a few more facts that might interest you. I've just put, yet it is the New Testament which is doubted. There's the same chart with a bit added. First of all, I talk about the early church writers. Do you know, in the first and second centuries, there were many church writers who wrote commentaries on the Bible, and in their commentaries, they quote passages from the New Testament. And do you know, there are 36,000 quotations from the New Testament. 36,000. You can more or less compile the whole New Testament just from the quotations of the early church fathers. So do you see, not only do we have 13,000 complete copies, we've got 36,000 quotations. This is remarkable. On top of that, you've got lectionaries. Now, what's a lectionary? A lectionary is an order of service. And what they used to do, they had an order of service, and they then used to say, let someone read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. But after a while, they used to, instead of just saying, read 1 Peter 1, they used to write 1 Peter 1 in. And from collecting all these lectionaries, we have thousands of quotes from the New Testament as well. This is remarkable. You don't have anything like this on the history of Julius Caesar. Yet everyone in this room has been taught that Julius Caesar's time is fact, and that the Bible is to be doubted. Oh no, it's quite the opposite. It's the Bible you can trust. It's Julius Caesar we have a few doubts about. It's entirely the opposite, you see? This is remarkable. And notice what I've added at the bottom. When you compare all of these texts together, only half of 1% varies. In other words, 99.5% of all these quotations, of all these texts, are exactly the same as all the other texts. Whether they're dated from 800, 400, 1100 AD, whenever they come, they all agree 99.5% of the time. That is pretty accurate, isn't it? There's only a difference now in half a percent of the words that are given. And by the way, of those 400 words where there's a slight disagreement, 99% are spelling differences. I'll give you an example. David is sometimes spelt D-A-V-I-D, but in other places it's spelt D-A-V-E-I-D. But can you see, it makes no difference to the truth contained in the Bible. Do you see that? So there you've got it. 99% are spelling differences. For example, well here's an example, one says Theos, T-H-E-O-S, was manifested in the flesh. This is 1 Timothy, isn't it? The other says Os, O-S, who is manifested in the flesh. And that's one of the bigger differences that you will find in the New Testament. Now can you see, this is a most remarkable set of figures. And so, on the basis of this evidence, we can say that the Bible that was written by Paul and by Peter, by the writer to the Hebrews, is almost certainly exactly the same as the text that we have in front of us, right? And by the way, you, you know, don't you, that there are a whole group of people called lower critics who are our friends. And these lower critics spend their time trying to find earlier and earlier manuscripts. And I believe that before the rapture of the church, we are going to find the original manuscripts. I happen to believe that God still preserved them. Hallelujah, right? And we'll have Paul's thumbprint in the corner. And people will say, this is remarkable. We've actually got the original book of Romans. I believe we're going to find it. You see? And that will be the one. And we'll know every jot and tittle has been kept. You'll notice here, almost every jot and tittle is already re-established. These lovely Bible critics, uh, I mean the lower critics, you know, are our friends. The higher critics are our enemies, the lower critics are good friends of ours. And they're still doing their work, looking for earlier and earlier manuscripts. Now that's the New Testament. Can I now just show you uh, the Old Testament? And can we just have a look at some facts about the Old Testament? And here we have something remarkable. If I was giving this lecture in 1946, right, not only would I have a different voice to give it in, but um, 
we wouldn't have the information that we have today about this. For something happened in 1947 that was of wonderful significance for those of us who are Bible believers. Let's take the evidence as it was before 1947. Before 1947, and this is talking about the Old Testament, the earliest text of the Old Testament that we had was called the Cairo Codex, and it dated from 895 AD. Now remember that the Old Testament was completed in about 400 BC. Now do you see, that's a gap of 1,200 years, and that's not good. And obviously people would say, well, the Old Testament, how do you know it's the original? The first one we've got dates from 895. You can't base your faith on that. And before 1947, my Bible study would have been different. What I would have told you is, look, we can trust this text because of the way the Hebrews used to treat their holy books. Do you know, and I'll just tell you this in case you didn't know, there were certain people whose job it was to copy out the texts of the Old Testament. And these were dearly beloved believers. They loved the Word of God. They treated it as holy. And these men, they were called scribes, used to copy every word and every letter out, right? And you know, at the end, then, of their copying, they used to do something. They used to count the number of words in the text that they'd actually copied out. They used to count up the number of words. And what they used to do is illuminate the middle word. So they used to discover which was the middle word of the text. And they used to colour it in. They used to draw pretty pictures around it. You see? Then they used to uh, count up the number of letters and find which was the middle letter. And they used to colour that in and draw pretty pictures all the way around it. Then they used to take this script that they'd been copying from and they used to see which word and which letter had been illuminated in that text. And if it was the same word and the same letter, that was an exact copy, and they used to keep it. If it wasn't, if it was a different one, they used to destroy the last two or three years' work that they'd done. They used to set fire to it and burn it. And they used to start again, copying it. That's how accurate they felt they had to be concerning this. By the way, I should tell you this, in the Quran. It's different altogether. In the Quran, they copied it out and they burnt the original. <laughs> in case they've made an error. And you'll find, you can ask any Mohammedan this, any Islamic uh, scholar, you'll find that Islam knows nothing about textual criticism, about lower critics, because they don't have any old texts. They burnt them all. You see, they destroy them, just in case there's a difference between the two. The Hebrews were the opposite. They used to destroy the new one if it wasn't accurate. And that's how accurate they had to be. All right, but something happened in 1947 that was a bonus for us. In 1947, there was a little Bedouin boy who'd lost a goat. And he was wandering near the mountains, you know this story, I hope, near the uh, Dead Sea, and uh, he thought that goat's got into some of those caves up in the hillside. And what he did, he took stones and he was throwing them into the caves. And uh, in they went, and he was hoping for a ma, And out would rush this goat. Didn't hear it, or bleat, or whatever they do, right? And he went along, throwing these stones, and when he went to one cave, he threw a stone in, and instead of hearing a bleat, he heard the sound of broken pottery. What's that? He climbed up to the cave, and in the cave he discovered pots. He'd broken one, right? But it, there were hundreds of others, all containing ancient manuscripts. These are what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were 40,000 fragments of manuscript up there, including one complete copy of the prophet Isaiah, another slightly incomplete copy of Isaiah. Most of the Old Testament was there, and there were a few other books on top. These are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we've still got them. Right? Some of them haven't been opened yet, it's so difficult, but they're still being opened out. A lot have, but the work still is in progress, studying these particular scrolls. Now this was interesting. You see, this copy of the Old Testament dated not from 895 AD, 
But a thousand years earlier, they dated from 125 BC. Now, do you see what we've got here? We've got copies from 895. We now jump a thousand years, and we've got copies that are a thousand years older. Now we have the opportunity to see how accurate the copying's been. A whole thousand years has gone past. How accurate have they copied them? Well, let's see what we've got. There we go. Dead Sea Scrolls, 40,000 written fragments, 500 books in all, a copy of Isaiah from 125 BC. Accuracy at last could be tested. And here's what we come to. The Dead Sea Scrolls showed this, that 95% of the Old Testament was completely accurate, had been copied absolutely accurately. 95%, that's a very high proportion, you know. Very good. 5% varied. But of those 5%, most of the variations were only spellings. That's all. And I've given an example here from Isaiah 53, and I think it's worth our while turning to Isaiah 53. We may as well use our Bibles if you still got your Bible handy. In Isaiah and 53, this will show you the difference that there is. Now, it contains 166 Hebrew words, and there are only 17 letters that were different. Right? Ten of these were no more than spelling differences of the 17 letters. Four more were conjunctions, and one difference was in verse 1 of chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That's what it says in most of them. One of them had, on whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. I think you'd agree that makes very little difference to the meaning in the thing. And I put here the only significant difference that we have, the only significant difference is found in verse 9. And uh, if we could turn to that, verse 9 here, and he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Well, there's the difference. One says, in his deaths. The other says, in his high places. And one letter made the difference between these, these words. This is remarkable. A thousand years has gone past, and that's the only difference that there is. Well, there's nothing there to fundamentally undermine our faith in all of this. And, of course, they're still looking for older and older manuscripts, right, to actually uh, uh, get right back to the original. And I said there, another text of Isaiah was then found which actually corrected all of that. All right, now these are some of the facts, then, that we have about the Bible. And, by the way, I'm not afraid to give out these facts. These are wonderful things. And many of the people who criticize the Bibles have none of the facts at their fingertips. We as believers have got to have the facts right there. And by the way, don't you be taken in just because someone says something authoritatively. I had a Mormon who came along and says, well, even the Dead Sea Scrolls say that Jesus had three wives. I said, well, that's most remarkable, because most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written before Jesus was ever born. I said, that is remarkable. Oh, um, the other chap said, shut up. And <laughs> don't you be taken in by them, you see? And there are a lot of people today who talk a lot of rubbish, but they say it authoritatively. You check up the facts. We've got enough facts now that we can check up whether a statement is right or whether it's wrong. All right, now all of this is useful. But for the rest of this Bible study, I want to now take you on one of the most glorious trips that I can think of. I've said that the lower critics are our friends, and I want to tell you about some of the wonderful people who've helped us discover what we know about the Bible. These are men that most Christians today have never heard of, and yet I believe that many of them are going to have their names written in the annals of God's history. They are some of the most important men and believers 
that you could wish to find anywhere. By the way, do you know one man, I think, that we rarely think of as a wonderful believer is the chap who actually compiled Young's analytical concordance. I don't know of many Christians today who would do what he did. Do you know, for 40 years of his life, that's how long it took him to write Young's analytical concordance. 40 years. He spent 40 years of his life pouring through the Bible, just making lists of words. Today, we have a computer that can do it. When he lived 150 years ago, we had no computer. That book, Young's Analytical Concordance, which is one I'm going to highly recommend to you all, right, when I come on to how to study the Bible for yourself, that has been of such tremendous value, it's hard to actually put a value on it. The 40 years that that man spent in his own study, and eventually he went off his head, that's how much it took from him, has caused so much increase in the Word of God, we owe him a tremendous debt. Today we're so busy, aren't we, we Christians? We're doing this and doing that and doing this glorious thing and doing that glorious thing. There are very few who would say, well, Lord, you've called me for 40 years just to make lists from the Bible. Very few indeed. This glorious man was prepared to do it because he saw how important it was. Well, his name's going to be written up in glory. Hallelujah. And I think some of the names on this list are going to be written up in glory as well. Right? Those of you who've heard my first tape in the basic course will know of the names of some people. Do you remember on that first tape, I actually talk about some crocodiles, do you remember, that were dropped? One crocodile was dropped. Do you remember this? Dr. Grenville and Dr. Hunt, who did uh, um, research in Oxyrhynchus, and do you remember, they were looking for treasure, and they found this place that was absolutely full of stuffed crocodiles, and one of the slaves was carrying a stuffed crocodile out, dropped it, it broke open, and inside it was full of Koine Greek grammar books. Wasn't that wonderful? And because of that error, or did an angel trip him up? That's what I think <laughs> happened. We discovered the full grammar of the New Testament. Without it, we wouldn't know what we know today. Well, they go on the top of my list. Right? But there are other glorious believers. And I'm going to take you through a safari of some of these people. There's the top one. Doctors Grenville and Hunt at Oxyrhynchus. And if you want to know about them, you must listen to my first tape in the basic series. Basic series BBS number one. All right. Now, I hope all of you have heard of those. I hope also you've heard of the others. Let's go on to number two. And here we come to a very famous text of the Bible indeed. It's called the Codex Sinaiticus, S-I-N-A-I-T-I-C-U-S, or Codex Aleph, as they call it. And this is a complete copy of the New Testament, which dates from about 365 AD. Now fancy that. We actually have the New Testament, almost complete, from 365 AD. And if you've heard of this text, you should have heard of this wonderful man, Count Constantine von Tischendorf. If you've heard of von Tischendorf, you've looked into the text of the Bible. If you've never heard of him, I'm going to introduce you to this lovely man. This man spent the whole of his life looking for texts of the Bible. And in 1844, he was out on his travels. And of course, it wasn't travel such as I know. You go to Heathrow and you fly out and someone meets you at the airport and, and all the rest. You literally had to set out and you didn't know what it was going to be like. And in 1844, this man found himself in the Sinai Peninsula and uh, they always used to stay at the monasteries. You see, there were no Hilton hotels <coughs> or bed and breakfast places or things like that. And you used to head for the monastery. And there's a monastery which is still there called St. Catherine's, right, in Sinai. And he decided to stay overnight there. And while he was there, he decided to look through their library to see if they had any ancient manuscripts. That's what he was after. And this man searched. While they got his room ready, he searched through the library. But it was all rubbish. You know, there was nothing good, nothing that interested him. And finally, he went back to his room, and the room was all ready, and what they'd done, because they had all this old manuscript uh, stuff around, they used to light fires with old manuscripts. 
and there was his fire ready to be lit and there was a pile of old manuscripts and the idea was he set fire to it and he'd warm himself as these manuscripts burnt. Well, being the man that he was, he just picked up one of the pages of this manuscript that they put to put on the fire. And as he began to read it through, it was part of the New Testament. And he picked up another piece, part of the New Testament. And a very old part of the New Testament. It was vellum. Do you know what vellum is? They used to write on three things. Either papyrus, which was made out of a reed, or vellum, which was antelope and calf skin. That was very expensive, vellum was. Uh, If you couldn't afford that, you used to write on parchment, which was the sheep and goat skin. You see, this was vellum. And he picked it up, couldn't believe it. And he said to the chap, look, where did you get this from? Oh, from a room over there. Oh, quick. And he took the bucket, you know, with the sheets in, and they showed him the others. He found there were 129 sheets that were almost the whole of the New Testament. He couldn't believe it. He got so excited that the monks began to smell a rat. And they used to say, well, all this old rubbish we've got here, and he's interested in that pile of papers that we were about to burn. He said, look, I I want to take this. Can I have it? Oh, no, it's far too valuable for you to take. (laughs) They were just about to burn it on this fire. He said, look, I've got to have this. Oh, no, 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 you you mustn't have it. No, no. And so they wouldn't let him have it. And do you know what he had to do? Count von Tischendorf actually spent three months of his life copying the text out. He stayed there and copied it out. And when he left, he bargained with them and they allowed him to take 43 sheets away with him. And they sent the rest of the 129 sheets, home to Russia. They were Russian Orthodox Christians. Right? So the majority went to Russia. Count von Tischendorf took 43 sheets, and so it remained. And in, um, I think it was 1862, he published the text of Sinaiticus, for, or Sinaiticus, for everyone to read. By the way, where is this found today, this text? Well, it's good news for us. The communists in Russia were hard of cash in 1933 and they put these sheets on the market and the good old British government bought them up. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And we paid them only £100,000 and we got those sheets and today if you go to the British Museum, they're on show, they're bound together and it's one of the earliest texts of the New Testament and you can actually see it there. I actually have a photograph of one of the sheets from it. It's beautifully written and if you want to see this you're free to come to the front to have a look at it. And that's a sheet from John's Gospel out of uh, Sinaiticus. Do you see how beautiful it is? Very well preserved. You see that would have uh, warmed him for about five minutes if they'd set fire to it. But Count von Tischendorf spent his whole life wandering round the Middle East, looking for ancient texts. And it's this glorious man to whom we owe this lovely text of the Bible, the Sinaiticus, you see? All right, so there's a man that you ought to note. However, if you note him, I think you ought to give a gold medal to the next chap. Here we come to another codex, another complete version of the New Testament. Uh, Number three, Codex Vaticanus, right? Or Codex B, that should be, not eight. Codex B. Um, And that dates from 325 AD, and uh, that's older than the Codex Sinaiticus. By the way, I wish this was preached from every pulpit in the land, so that we might see that the Bible is trustworthy. It's a very fascinating story, all of this. Now, as the name suggests, this was the copy of the New Testament that was locked away in the Vatican Library. I don't know whether you know this, but the Vatican doesn't like revealing the treasures that it's got there. I tell you, there are things hidden away in the Vatican that I would like to get my hands on. And I don't just mean the gold salt cellar either, right? I think they may very well have some original texts back in the Vatican. I'd love it to be opened, you see. Anyway, this man, who was a good friend of von Tischendorf, called Tregels, or Tregelis, He actually uh, went along to the Vatican and he said, excuse me, these are my words, "Uh, excuse me, I understand you've got a complete text of the New Testament. They said, yes. He said, could I have your permission to study it? No, they said. And finally he wrote to them and said, look, I am the professor of New Testament literature in Leipzig. And finally the Pope, reading his letter, said, well, all right, you can, but you can only have a look at it for six hours. 
And Tregelles came along and he had a look at this codex and he saw it was one of the most wonderful uh, texts of the New Testament that he'd ever seen. And over the next two years, he used to send letters galore to the Pope. Please, can I come and study it more? Please, please, please. And finally, two years later, 1845, this is, um, the Vatican finally relented and said, well, all right, you can come for six hours every day, but you are not allowed to bring in a pencil and you're not allowed to bring in paper. You're only allowed to look at the thing. Trigel said, okay, okay, I'll do it. And do you know what this wonderful man did? Now, you imagine this. For six hours every day he went in. He was searched when he went in. He had a different page open, two pages in front of him every day. And for six hours, he just sat there looking at it like this. As soon as they kicked him out, he ran home and he copied out everything he'd memorized that day. He memorized it in Greek, in Aramaic, and in Hebrew. Spent all night writing it out. And the next day, he was there again and memorized the next two pages. Within three months, he'd memorized the whole of the Codex Vaticanus. Finally, the Pope said, well, you've had enough. And two years later, he published the whole text. And it was so accurate that the Pope said, well, we may as well release it to the world now. I tell you, I wish we had believers of this ilk around today. Most believers are so taken up with their own affairs... You know, they're not so interested in the Word of God as all this. If ever a man deserved a gold medal, it's this man, Tregelles. And I believe God gave him supernatural ability to memorize during that time. Three months, that's all. You try and memorize the book of Romans. No, you try and memorize 2 John, which is the shortest book in the Bible. And you'll sort of see the struggle that he had. All right. For completeness sake, let me give you another one. It's a fascinating little story, this, isn't it, you know? And I think every Christian should know this. History of the Bible is part of our heritage. And here we get another codex, which is a very good one, Codex Alexandrinus. And this dates from 450 AD, and as its name suggests, it was actually a, a text of the New Testament which was found in Alexandria. And I'll just tell you a little story about this. In 1621 AD, that is, of course, it was moved from Alexandria to Constantinople. And in 1627 AD, it was given as a present to King Charles I of England. And he received this as a present. It was to celebrate the publishing of the King James Version of the Bible. And uh, he received it. And that's why this one's in England today. We've got an awful lot of good stuff in England. And this is another text that is in, in our hands. The next one is a fascinating story. It's got a rather large title, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. There it is. I better spell that. C-O-D-E-X. New word. E-P-H-R-A-E-M-I. Ephraimi. Rescriptus. R-E-S-C-R-I-P-T-U-S. And rescriptus means to be written again. Let me tell you the story of this one. This is a fascinating one. This concerns a woman who is called Catherine de Medici. She's a very famous lady. She was actually the wife of King Henry II of France. And by the way, she gave birth to four sons who all became European kings, right? And this woman became rather religious in her old age. And she fell in love with the writings of a Syrian monk whose name was Father Ephraim. And he'd written certain theological works dating from about 1553. And she collected all his works together, and she studied them. And when she died, she left the whole lot to the National Library of France. And they took a look at them, and no one really wanted them, and they bunged them away in an alcove, you see. And for 245 years, not one person had to look at them, until finally a French student had to write a thesis on Father Ephraim. And so he went to the National Library in, in uh, France and he said, excuse me, have you got anything by Father Ephraim? Oh, we've got the whole of the Medici collection. Oh, he said, could I have them? And he sat at a desk by the window in this library and he started reading Father Ephraim. Right? And he got to a certain book, some of the sermons of Father Ephraim, and as he was reading them, the sun caught the page. And as he looked at it, he suddenly realized there were indentations in the page. 
that didn't fit the letters of Father Ephraim. It was all handwritten stuff. And he looked at it carefully, and he actually carefully, he put a piece of paper over it and scribbled over it, and he suddenly discovered that it was a text of the Bible that was impressed upon the sheets of vellum. Now, I should tell you what has happened. This is called a palimp set, by the way. That's the name we give to it. You see, paper and writing material were so short in the Middle Ages that often what they used to do is take some old vellum, rub out the writing that was already on it, and use it again and write their own stuff on it. Father Ephraim had so loved his own work, he'd taken a very old copy of the Bible, had rubbed out the text of the Bible to write his sermons. I know Bible teachers who do that regularly, you see. But that's what he'd actually done. And in fact, when the scholars had a look at it, they found that this was one of the most wonderful texts of the Bible they'd ever discovered. It was very ancient and very accurate. And today, that text of the Bible is in the Louvre in uh, Paris. And you can go and see it there for yourself. It's wonderful, isn't it, how God has preserved his word. Praise God. So dear Catherine Medici didn't know what she was missing when she was reading the sermons of Father Ephraim. Oh, here we get it. Chester Beatty. Right? That's how you should pronounce that. Chester Beatty. The Chester Beatty Papyri. He was an American millionaire, would you guess? <laughs> right? And this man, I think it was from Philadelphia, he so loved the Bible that he went all around the Middle East buying up piles of old manuscripts. Most of them were rubbish. We had plenty of money. And the Jews knew a good thing, when, uh, and the Arabs knew a good thing when they saw one. And then they used to march, and they used to say, sure, very important, these, these are. And they used to write a, a check for them and used to collect them, you see. But one day, he actually bought something that was valuable. And the Chester Beatty papyri, which are actually in the University of Philadelphia on show today, um, are actually some very accurate texts of the Bible. By the way, he bought this job lot. In the middle of this job lot were the missing sheets of Codex Sinaiticus. Wasn't that wonderful? So we have the complete Codex Sinaiticus. That's lovely. But there were also copies of the four Gospels, many of Paul's letters that had been written, and these are some of the most ancient manuscripts that are found of the New Testament around. Isn't it lovely? And bless his heart. He's with the Lord now, this man. But praise the Lord for people with money who will use it effectively of that sort. I'm sure I do him a great disservice. He was undoubtedly a lovely Bible believer. There we are. Chester Beatty. There we go. Um, I could go on and on on this uh, voyage. For example, uh, I don't have time tonight. If you've never heard of Deisman, D-E-I-S-S-M-A-N, who wrote a book called Light from the Near East. It's a wonderful book. He shed so much light on the meaning of the New Testament. Never heard of him, you've missed a lot. The next man, Horonsky. And the next man, Winkler. These are the men who discovered the Hittite Empire. And they were the people who learned how to translate Hittite. We didn't know how to read Hittite. These men cracked the language. We owe a lot to these men. We've discovered so much about the history of the Bible. Well, these are famous names that we could talk about. Uh, I've included this one, Klein, for obvious reasons. The chap who runs the tapes, who's sitting over here, his name is Klein. <laughs> Spelt with a C, but undoubtedly German in origin. Praise the Lord. And this uh, chap, Klein, discovered the Moabite stone. Up to this time, everyone had said that Moses couldn't have written the uh, Old Testament, you know, the first five books, because writing hadn't been invented that early. Right? It was finds of stones like the Moabite stone that proved they were wrong. And the Moabite stone isn't quite as early as that, but it was one of a group of stones that came to light that showed that writing was much earlier than they thought. Anyway, Klein was a German missionary, and he suddenly found that a group of Bedouins had a black column that they were carrying around with them. And when he looked at it, he realized it was a very important column because it had ancient history written on this column. And he said, uh, I want to buy it. The Bedouins, who saw how delighted he was with it, it was just a doorstop for them, suddenly said, oh, it's very expensive. <laughs> and they asked him such a lot of money, he didn't have that money. He went home to Germany and asked the German government to give him the money to buy the Moabite stone. But they couldn't agree. 
So then a Frenchman came along, whose name was Clément Ganneau. There he is. And he arrived, he saw the same stone, he'd heard about this. He translated it and found it was actually 2 Kings chapter 3 that was written, which is all about Moab. You see, you read 2 Kings 3 for yourself. It was all written on this column. And he said to them, I'll pay whatever you want. The French government has told me we can have it as much as we want. That's a good government, isn't it, you see? And they said, oh, I'm afraid something's happened to it. They said, we've dropped it, and it's shattered into a thousand pieces. And you know what they've done? They've broken the stone up into a thousand pieces. And every Bedouin had one piece. And they said, well, you, you have to pay a lot of money for my piece. And it was this man, Clermont Ganneau, who actually bought up every piece that was going, and it was him who reassembled the whole thing. And you today, go to the Louvre in Paris, and you can see the Moabite stone, all put back together. L lovely men these are, you know, who were so, felt that uh, truth was so important that uh, it was worth spending money on and time. All right, last of all, I just want to mention, and we'll complete tonight with this, the Rosetta Stone. And this will show you the type of archaeology. We're on general archaeology now, of course. The Rosetta Stone, I've got a photograph of it, is a basalt stone. <clears throat> you can actually see it in the British Museum. <laughs> but it was actually discovered by Napoleon's army in 1799. Now, the important thing is, I don't know whether you can see this, can you see it's divided into three sections? One, two, three. Now, before this stone was discovered, we had no idea how to read Egyptian hieroglyphics. They were just hieroglyphics, as far as we were concerned. And it was so frustrating for Bible believers, because, you see, there were all sorts of inscriptions in Egypt, and we couldn't read any of them. But the marvellous thing about this was this, that there was a section in hieroglyphics. Here was a section in Greek, and here was a section in what we call demotic, which was written Egyptian. Now, they couldn't understand demotic, they couldn't understand hieroglyphics, but they could understand Greek. Now they had things that they could compare with one another. And by making careful comparisons of the text, they cracked hieroglyphics. Now, a Frenchman called Champollion was the chap who did it. Notice how the French and the Germans and the British figure so highly in all of this. And it was through this very stone here that we discovered what hieroglyphics meant and how to read them. Well, this, is, uh, this has been background, but I hope you will realise, as I realise, this isn't unimportant stuff. This is very important stuff. For with all of this information, we are able to say this, that the Bible that we have in our hands is the original Bible as Moses wrote it, is the original Bible as Daniel had it, is the original Bible that Malachi studied, is the original Bible that Jesus studied, and is the very Bible that Paul himself studied. And when you read Hezekiah, the accounts of Hezekiah, when you read the account of Jonah, why, that's the very account that Jesus read, to the letter. When the Bible critic therefore comes along and says, how do you know that this is the original Bible? I think you better say, well, actually, there's a tape, you know, that I think I can put you onto. Not much Bible in it, but there's an awful lot of history. I have to tell you this, I've only scratched the surface tonight of some of the glorious things I could tell you about the history of the Word of God. But I don't know about you, they thrill my heart. But it's not finished yet. <clears throat> We've got our part to play. Oh no, you may not be clever enough to do any more research like this. I mean, keep your lookout, a lookout if you're in Jerusalem, you know, in those bazaars. There might just be a little fragment. <laughs> you just watch it. You know, they'll turn up. You have no idea. They will. You may not be like that, but I'll tell you what we've got to do. We've got to get the Word of God out to an unbelieving generation. And that's why, of course, in the tape ministry, we feel that is our job, as far as our own nation is concerned, and some other nations around the world. Let everyone else, if you want, get on with the joyous Christian life. We're going to get on with the joyous Christian life as well. But our main aim is that the Word of God might be taught, and taught as fact again. And I would ask you to join with us in prayer that the Word of God will 
get out. All right, next uh, week we're going to see the canon of Scripture and we'll be talking about the Apocrypha and why the Apocrypha is not inspired. And then um, in the evening session I'll be talking about contradictions in the Bible. And I'll be listing as many as I can possibly get in, right? Passages where you read and they seem to say two different things and I'll be showing you the answer to them or why they seem to be contradictory. Let's just pray together, shall we, before we go home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, dear Jesus, praise you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I do thank you for your grace upon me tonight. Father, most unusual Bible study, and yet you've been here, Lord. I do thank you for these men who've laid down their lives that we might see that the Word of God really is what it purports to be, the very Word of the living God. Oh, Father, I do thank you from the bottom of my heart for men like von Tischendorf, men like Tregels, men like Young, Robert Young, Father, we know that last century there were giants of the faith in our land. And Father, we long to see them again. Father, we ask your forgiveness tonight that so much of our Christianity is self-centered. We're concerned about my blessing. God, will you bless me? I pray, Father, that we might get through that and realize that the greatest blessing we can possibly have is when we bless you. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, for all those who labor in the Word and doctrine, all those who labor as they try and study the Word, and and those who labor as they want to be faithful witnesses to you. Father, that you will bless them, and that, Father, they might indeed know that food which comes from doing the will of the Father. May we be joined as one, Father, as we really come and confront this nation again with the claims of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you for revival, nothing less in this land, a biblically-based revival. (coughs) Father, we believe you hear our prayer, and we believe you're going to answer it. Please just bless all those involved in the tape ministry. Bless all those tonight, the thousands, Father, who regularly receive the tapes. Bless all of us, Lord that we should indeed be stirred up to serve you even more than we have done in the past. Father, we thank you we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. May we find our hearts strangely stirred by them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.